So um, this is airways, disease, and diagnostic testing, pulmonary. Um, you know, please try to keep this active. You know, if you don't know something, pause and test yourself, um, especially as we get to some of the more nuanced um, asthmatic subtypes, um, as well as doing these mix-up questions. Do mix-up questions and then uh, use this as kind of a supplement to that um, to make sure you're doing active learning, fill, fill in any knowledge gaps. All right, so first to mix up pulmonary question 97. Um, and then going through this question, this is really about uh, pulmonary diagnostic testing and interpretation of PFTs, which is a big critical part of pulmonary and requires a decent amount of understanding of pulmonary as well. So going into this. Um, so going into this, kind of let's kind of go through um, our different uh, interpretation of PFTs, right? So first, uh, your first question usually is, is it obstructive or is it restrictive, right? So um, your big question is I look first, is it restrictive? And obstructive is going to be an FEV1 to FEC ratio less than 70%. This is always kind of difficult. So here is a picture of the alveoli. Here is the intracranial space. And here is your chest wall. So why do our patients unable to increase their FEV1 when they have some sort of obstructive deficit? So this is due to dynamic airway collapse. So when people have um, obstructive disease, they can have it for a couple of reasons. One, uh, they can have um, they can have COPD, um, and COPD kind of comes in, maybe it's not as accepted anymore, but two forms of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So emphysema is really going to be destruction of these airways here, so destruction of these uh, alveolar sacs, and what this does, it decreases the elasticity um, in your alveoli, which basically decreases airflow. So that decreases airflow um, because you decrease elasticity, so it decreases the pressure. Um, in chronic bronchitis and asthma, it's a little bit different. So chronic bronchitis is a, uh, not as much of an accepted subtype of COPD, but in these patients, um, they are going to get uh, basically inflammation of your bronchi bronchiolar walls, mucus hypersecretions, use muscle hypertrophy uh, and inflammation, and really the same thing with asthma. So what these are going to do is create resistance uh, within the airway itself, and that resistance within the airway itself is going to decrease the amount of air that's really able to escape out. So when these patients try to breathe out really, really quickly and you increase their FEV1, yes, it does help because when they breathe out very quickly, they put pressure on the alveoli. Um, and those alveoli increase pressure, which increases airway pressure. Problem is with this is they have so much obstruction, either to decrease pressure in the alveoli from emphysema or bronchi, um, bronchiolar um, narrowing, is that this also creates pressure around the bronchioles. So that increased pressure on the bronchioles can also increase collapse of the bronchioles, which is why they really get into um, a homeostasis where they can only increase their FEV1 so much when they breathe out very quickly. If they try to breathe out too hard, that chest wall pressure actually causes collapse of the bronchioles um, in narrowed bronchioles or in bronchioles where there's just not enough pressure due to the inelasticity of alveoli to emphysema. So we kind of went over this already, um, but your approach when you find an obstructive deficit, I'm just going to go over the three major subtypes here. Um, if you do find an obstructive deficit and you see a DLCO, a low DLCO. So that's going to be more emphysema. The reason why emphysema, we kind of went over why it causes an obstructive deficit, but the reason why emphysema causes reduction of DLCO is you destroy these alveolar walls. You destroy the surface area of the alve alveoli, and the structure of the surface area of the alveoli decreases the ability of carbon monoxide to diffuse across that surface area and go to the capillaries, which means that you're gonna have a reduction in your DLCO or diffusion of carbon monoxide from your alveoli uh, and into the capillaries. Now, if there's a normal level DLCO, it does not mean the patient doesn't still doesn't have COPD. Um, what it means is the patient doesn't likely have emphysema. Your big question here, we're going to go through the pathophysiology of asthma and COPD is what is your FEV1 response? Um, you know, asthma has more of uh, bronchoconstriction uh, in uh, the face of irritants, 
um, or allergens or exercise. Um, so those patients, when you give these patients an, inha an inhaler, like an albuterol inhaler, they should actually have a pretty good FEV1 response, and there should be some reversal of that bronchoconstriction. So if there is reversal of that bronchoconstriction um, with albuterol, and you can see some dilation here, and increase FEV1 with albuterol, those patients are going to most likely have asthma, or the diagnostic asthma. If it does not, these patients still likely COPD uh, and chronic bronchitis. Now, there is other things that can cause obstructive deficits. So I'm not going to go into too much. Um, the big ones you think about is bronchiectasis and really um, dilation, flimsy, and flimsy uh, bronchi bronchial walls cause them more likely to collapse. And there's even other uh, diffuse pro diffuse parenchymal lung diseases that affect your bronchioles and cause an inflammation of bronchioles. The big ones is hypersensitivity like luminized and sarcoidosis that can also cause a obstructive deficit. But these really are your main ones. And if you're really concerned about <laughs> diffuse parenchymal lung disease, you know, maybe check out high resolution CT. The same thing with bronchiectasis. So next one is going to be your isolated reduction of DLCO. So going over DLCO. So carbon oxide here. DLCL is looking at diffusion of carbon monoxide from your alveoli uh, and into your pulmonary capillaries, right? So how does it do it? All well, the pulmonary arterial brings RBCs, right? And the RBCs go ahead and bind that carbon, uh, bind to that carbon monoxide and allow it to diffuse from your, <clears throat> allow it to diffuse from your alveoli uh, and into your, um, into your pulmonary arterials. These patients have a reduction of a low DLCO um, because these patients may not have any restrictive lung disease yet and any pulmonary fibrosis yet um, in some cases. Um, so these patients usually don't have a diffuse peripheral lung disease. If they did, more likely they would be in a non-restrictive category. So what type of things can cause a reduction of the DLCO? Well, one is going to be um, anemia. Right, so uh, most PFTs should correct for anemia with their DLCO, and they have a formula for it. But if they don't, this can throw you off, right? They have decreased RBCs, they're going to decrease the carbon monoxide uptake from RBCs. So anemia can do it, um, but most PFTs should really uh, do a formula that accounts for what their patient's uh, hemoglobin is. The next one, and the big one you're going to think about, is really going to be destruction of this pulmonary arterial. What kind of things can cause pulmonary arterial disruption? Maybe test yourself real quick on that one, and then we'll go into it. But the big ones is going to be um, really going to be pulmonary hypertension. So that can be either two things, acute pulmonary hypertension uh, secondary to PA or, or chronic pulmonary hypertension, which has a myriad of uh, different um, causes which we'll review on our pulmonary hypertension, uh, pulmonary hypertension lecture. So pulmonary hypertension can do it, um, a PE can do it, uh, as well as, you know, things rarer like vasculitis. And um, another thing to look out for, another reason maybe check out high res CT, early ILD can do this as well. I'm not exactly sure if it's more of that early ILD causes more pulmonary arterial or destruction which reduces the amount of carbon monoxide that's up, up taken from the alveoli, or there's just not enough fibrosis quite yet to get a restrictive deficit, but they still have decreased diffusion from that, from that fibrosis from their, uh, you know, uh, alveoli to the capillary. But early ILD can cause a reduction in, in DLCO before it causes anything else. Lastly, we're going to go to our restrictive. So restrictive, um, these patients should not have an obstructive disorder. Um, if we're looking at this in really in a vacuum, uh, but their FEC, their force vital capacity, um, is going to be less than 80%, um, meaning they have more stiff lungs. They're not able to take a full, 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 full deep breath um, like other people, right? So what are some of the causes of restricted deficits? So the easiest one, the thing that we think of probably about the most um, is going to be things that really affect the diffusion of carbon monoxide um, across the alveolar capillary membrane um, by increasing the, the uh, alveolar thickness, right? So <clears throat> that's going to be things like 
ILD. Um, and, you know, carbon dioxide is going to have a harder time diffusing across this thick membrane and into the blood. So that's going to have reduction in DLCL. One thing people do kind of forget about as well is that patients, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to differentiate ILD with heart failure. Uh, both can have CT findings, um, you know, crown glass opacities, uh, both can have intralobular thickening, um, both can have hypoxia. So something to think about here is heart failure. Heart failure, that fluid, and it deepens the alveoli. Not only is it going to cause a restricted deficit, in which these patients can't open their alveoli too well, um, because of all that edema, they're going to have stiffer lungs. It's also going to cause a decreased diffusion across that, across that alveolar capillary membrane. So heart failure is still in your differential when you have a restricted deficit and reduction in DLCL. Your next ones are going to have a normal DLCO. So since they, these have a normal DLCO, it tells you really that there's not any uh, parenchymal abnormalities going on. This is going to be extra parenchymal. Um, your next step here was doing a MIP or a MEP. Uh, I've seen this uh, called a bunch of different things, MIPs, MEPs, NIPs. Uh, but really what you're looking at with these is inspiratory force and expiratory force. So that's going to be your main deciding factor and maybe something that you're still in a restricted deficit with a normal DLCO. You're really looking to see the people do they it really looks to see if the patient has neuromuscular weakness. If they have a normal MIP or MEP, these patients don't have any neuromuscular weakness, right? These are just caused by um, things that uh, really cause extracranchymal constriction, right? So um, extracranchymal constriction, or sorry, extracranchymal extracranchymal restriction would be things like obesity, kyphoscoliosis, um, chest wall disorders, maybe maybe bilateral pleural fusion. All of these would cause restriction. That would um, decrease the ability for the patient to take a full breath, but their diaphragm still works. Um, they're neuromuscularly intact, so they can still breathe out quickly. Um, and breathe in quickly so their max inspiratory and expiratory force would be normal. Your next one, if you have a low MIP, low MEP, you're only able to breathe out quickly. These patients are more likely to have um, diaphragmatic disorders, right? So their diaphragm isn't working uh, well, so they're not able to breathe in, breathe out, they're not able to uh, ventilate their lungs. <clears throat> so they may have a low MIP, low MEP, and really you think about Muscular disorders, um, myositis, uh, dermatomyositis, polymyositis. Um, you can think about neuromuscular disorders. Uh, so you can think about myositis gravis, uh, language eaten. You can think about um, so bulbar or ALS when I present like this. So you really want to think about diaphragm disorders. Um, a lot of them that I just kind of noted. Well, when you see someone that comes in a restricted deficit and they have a low MIP and a low MIP. All right, so that's kind of going over our interpretation of PFTs. It's kind of one of the biggest things to <clears throat> understand in pulmonary at a medical student level and also, also to review again at a uh, resident level as well. All right, so next question, do you mix up 19, pulmonary question 17. All right, so I think this one is uh, getting in mostly, we're getting to asthma, pathogenesis, diagnosis, um, things like that. Uh, so going over the pathogenesis and asthma. So what's going on with asthma? So you get some sort of inhaled of irritants, right? So these irritants can be a lot of different things. It can be perfume, it can be organic substances, inorganic, well, mostly organic substances. Um, allergens, it could be exercise, it could be even sometimes gastric uh, um, fluid inhalation with people with curved. So these inhaled antigens cause mostly, well, in all cases, allergic or not allergic asthma, um, they're going to cause a T-cell reaction. And these T-cells, what they end up doing is um, really uh, causing inflammation of your bronchioles which over time can cause um, some of the chronic remodeling of asthma. So a lot of times with re-exposure of these inhaled agents, it can have IgE-mediated reactions, increased leukotriene secretion, um, and 
uh, bronchial constriction, mucus excretion, that can cause exacerbations. But over time, it's making people realize they can really have those chronic changes of asthmatic. So if you look at normal histology here um, of your bronchial, here's the lumen. It's normal. It's open. Um, here's your epith epithelium here. Here's your smooth muscle. Um, but when you look at a chronic asthmatic, you can see things like mucus hypersecretion. You can see that their basement membrane is increased. You can see that there's fibrosis. You can see that there's smooth muscle, smooth muscle hypertrophy. All these things causing inflammation, but also subsequently uh, causing uh, bronchial, bronchial narrowing. So everyone with asthma needs PFDs. It's, it's, it's a necessity. Um, Really, uh, for these patients, um, you really want to look to see uh, if there's obstruction, right? So people with these chronic changes of asthma from T-cell inflammation, eosinophilic inflammation in patients with um, allergic asthma, uh, or neutrophilic inflammation in patients with what they used to call old school intrinsic asthma, they're going to get uh, these inflammatory changes. They're going to get bronchial narrowing, and that bronchial narrowing can cause obstruction. But... But, but, but some people really only get uh, bronchial, uh, bronchial hyperreactivity and bronchial narrowing and restriction, reversible bronchial constriction with irritants and allergens. So some patients might not have these changes and some patients uh, might just have reversible bronchial constriction. So you always need to remember if the patient has normal PFTs and you have a high suspicion the next thing you want to do is check your methacholine <clears throat> challenge tested uh, as well. The methacholine challenge um, really looks at reversal of bronchial constriction in the face of an irritant or muscular antagonist. Um, and, uh, you know, this can make the diagnosis of asthma um, in the patients that don't have an obstructive deficit and maybe didn't really have a lot of this chronic remodeling um, secondary to asthma. All right. So do you go to step 19, question 24? All right. So we went through pathogenesis. Um, so diagnosed with asthma, we went through PFTs already. Uh, and then looking at the labs. Um, so uh, maybe we'll go into clinical manifestations of asthma. So a lot of these asthma patients can have short breath for a long time if they have obstructive deficits. But the hallmark of asthma is that reversal bronchial constriction uh, in the setting of uh, various stimuli, irritants, allergens, infections. And infections are a big one because these patients can have a robust response. If their asthma is uncontrolled outside the hospital, they're high risk. This can lead them to be hospitalized and um, subsequently death uh, in, in certain cases, cases, unfortunately. So there's two types. Uh, so there is, well, old school. This is old school, is that there's two types of asthma, not really accepted anymore, but I'm going to teach it because I think it's somewhat helpful to think about asthma. There's extreme music asthma. This is allergic asthma, young patient, A to P. Maybe they have atopic dermatitis. Maybe they have um, uh, nasal, like sinus uh, disease from allergens. Um, but then there's also intrinsic. And I think this is good to remember because some people really don't fit this extrinsic asthma category, especially in my patients, adult patients, you can get asthma as an adult. Sometimes it's less likely to be eosinophilic inflammation, more, more, more neutrophilic inflammation. There is a increased um, concordance with patients with severe obesity, uh, and it, it sometimes is less steroids responsive. So just because someone's old and don't have history of ATP does not mean they don't have asthma. These are really not accepted subtypes anymore. Um, these are kind of our agreed upon subtypes here, but it's good to remember because patients don't always fit that atopic subtype with having asthma. And I think sometimes these patients are diagnosed with COPD, uh, even though they've had, you know, less than a 20 pack year history of smoking. Um, so lastly, for workup diagnosis, we went through the methical challenge. Labs, you really almost always want to check. Some say it's only checking with clinical suspicions. It could be a CBC with dip and total IgA. If the CBC with dip or total IG are elevated, um, you can really make the diagnosis of some type of allergic asthma, and that's going to help you um, for further diagnostic testing and also treatment. So when you think you want to check it, chest six or eight, you can pulse. Um, if it's a slam dunk, you know, it's maybe a young patient, um, 
no other uh, past medical history, kind of, you know, very typical manifestations of asthma. You may not need it, but older patients or if you have any atypical features, um, you really want to check an x-ray, maybe do an ACT, uh, looking for bronchiectasis, ILD, heart failure, or cancer, hematitic depends really on your clinical suspicion. Um, all right, what is our next question here? Okay, the Duke mix up. Pulmonary makes that question for you. All right, um, going through this one, I think this starts getting more into the agreed upon subtypes of uh, asthma. You might get a little, you're really going to get most of this with the history physical, looking for the CDC to dip into a lot of The big one is going to be allergic. Really important to make the diagnosis of allergic asthma um, by looking at the history of ATP, high EOs, of the IGA. Because you can figure out what they're allergic to by doing skin, skin prick testing or IG specific antibodies. Um, antibodies. Uh, and that's uh, gonna help you diagnose what the trigger is and you could trigger and you could treat them with things like allergen avoidance, biologics, and even um, with an allergen help desensitization. And this can really help with control. Next one's going to be your call fairy asthma, and I'll put this together with exercise and juice asthma. Both are going to have less of that chronic remodeling in most cases and more of that reversal of bronchoconstriction. So a lot of times you need a methicolin challenge to diagnose these. Um, exercise induced juice bronchoconstriction. We'll go through the GINA guidelines in a little bit, but these follow the GINA guidelines. Really the only thing um, that's going to change is that your PRM, ICS, SABA, or ICS lava is going to be before exercise. Um, you can also do it as needed as well if they have maybe some asthma in the background. Um, occupational asthma, um, for, you know, this is more due to organic antigens that they encounter at work. Um, the biggest thing you want to do is spirometry before and after work exposure, just like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. These patients, there's a huge importance on avoidance, and they undergo the same normal um, Asthma treatment. Lastly, our second to last, reactive airway dysfunction syndrome. Um, I've also called this, I've seen irritant asthma as well. Uh, it used to be kind of a separate syndrome from my knowledge uh, and not other asthma subtype. <coughs> but um, these patients just get extremely high dose of some sort of pulmonary irritant. I had a patient in clinic once, um, had an extremely high dose of bleach, inhaled a ton of bleach um, while he was cleaning. He ended up going to the hospital um, with really severe wheezing. And then after that, never had asthma before, never had any obstruction before. After that happened, it must have caused some sort of uh, increased airway hypersensitivity um, due to his increased load and epithelial damage. This patient had bronchial hyperactivity, airway obstruction for a long period of time. These patients, um, you really treat them the same as asthma. Uh, as normal asthma as well, which we'll get to a little bit. And then lastly, it's going to be aspirin uh, exacerbated. So remember, arachidonic acid goes down into three different pathways, right? So there's thromboxane, uh, which can cause clots, prostaglandins, uh, as well as leukotrienes. And leukotrienes are a cornerstone in the eosinophil TH2 inflammation. So remember that NSAIDs and aspirin uh, really are going to decrease uh, prostaglandins. NSAIDs can cause increase of thromboxane, which is why all NSAIDs increase your risk of MI. Um, and aspirin and NSAIDs will increase your leukotrienes, uh, causing subsequent inflammation. Now, because the cornerstone of this is going to be shunting over to leukotrienes, these patients, um, other for treatment, uh, um, other than stopping NSAIDs or aspirin, you can. Uh, you really want to think about leukotriene antagonists too, so don't do like lots of leukotriene. Um, and then these are another patients that they may have a nasal polyposis on exam, severe persistent asthma, and pretty, and pretty elevation of EO secondary leukotrienes. All right, so this kind of goes over our pathogenesis, diagnosis, manifestations, and subtypes. Remember, not everyone's going to get chronic, chronic bronchial construction, so if you have a high suspicion, um, you really want to go uh, at a negative um, negative structural PFTs, you really want to check methicolin challenge testing.
All right, to pulmonary 19, question 85. So this gets starts getting into um, hazard management based on the GINA guidelines. So first thing you always want to do um, is uh, figure out how well controlled the asthma is, um, and you really want to use some sort of evidence-based tool to figure this out and something that you want to check and really trend on every single meeting, every single clinical uh, clinic, um, uh, every single clinic meeting that you have with the patient. So first we'll start off and we'll uh, kind of put these patients into categories. So step one to two, these patients are going to have less than or equal to almost daily, actually I'll say less than, less than almost daily symptoms. So some people say like less than four to five times a week uh, and less than weekly nighttime awakenings. Uh, step three, so these patients, um, when you start thinking about step three, they're gonna have uh, greater than or equal to almost daily symptoms. They're gonna have greater than or equal to uh, weekly nighttime awakenings. And this one is said by up to date, I'm not sure if it's much on mix app, but another patient population might put here is high risk. So ask if does a patient have poor PFTs, if they have obstructive deficit, do they have pretty poor non adherence to their medication? Have they been in the ICU? Have they been hospitalized recently? Um, are they a smoker? Uh, these are patients that might, or do they have obesity? These are patients that might be more of a high risk and you might put them in the step three category. Um, step four, this, um, either they're, either you're down titrating. So this happens a lot for me from, uh, as I'm a hospitalist for a recent exacerbation. Or they have almost daily symptoms. almost weekly or weekly nighttime awakenings and plus decrease lung function. And lastly, step five, these are patients that are kind of refractory to above and we'll get to the management of those. So <clears throat> this is kind of how you classify, if you're starting off for the first time, this is really how you're going to classify what type of uh, medication and what dose you're going to start with. Um, but for step, uh, you're going to start with. Um, but once you are seeing the patient, you're really going to step up and down um, to make sure that the patient has complete control of the asthma because that's going to prevent hospitalization if they get a respiratory infection. All right, to this question. And we will. Go over pathophysiology um, a little bit for uh, asthma, right? So asthma, we kind of went through this one a bit, but you have an antigen. An antigen is spotted to IgE. And for the acute response, that IgE is present in mast cells. Those mast cells are treated with the trienes. This with the trienes cause uh, reversal of bronchial constriction. So this is really going to be your acute exacerbations. Remember we talked about already, there's that late phase reaction, that chronic remodeling. This is mostly going to be patients here. Uh, it's going to be the allergen some type because it's eosinophilic inflammation. So these patients, they get the trigger, trigger and they get bronchioalveolar inflammation. They get T cell immune activation. And those T cells, which you see here, um, if they are Th2, they get a Th2 response, um, which is kind of your emergency response. They have IL-5 production which increases the acidophils, they have IL-4, which increase, increases basophils and IgA, uh, and they may even have IL-13 uh, IL as well, which can cause the mast cells and cotrine production. All things, especially the larger subtype, at least here, um, that uh, increases chronic remodeling, which we went over chronic inflammation of the airways. Uh, maybe the patients in the not accept internal intrinsic neutrophilic asthma they also have um, T cell activation of these patients and they have more of a neutrophilic response. Um, so that's kind of going into 
the pathogenesis of asthma, and I'll use this to go into the treatment. So this is really why your cornerstone of treatment is going to be steroids. So it used to be, uh, and I don't accept it anymore, that, you know, patients that said, let's say, asthma that was relatively well controlled could just be well, it's SABA's PRN. But to me, a SABA short acting beta agonist really doesn't hit the actual cause of asthma, which is going to be inflammation. So not only does it not help with inflammation during acute exacerbation with uh, mast cell degranulation of the vitrines, really doesn't decrease this bronchial alveolar constriction over time. So if you're not using steroids, you're inhaling steroids, you're not really treating the underlying cause of asthma. And it seems to me like those patients are really going to progress or they'll just keep using their inhaled short acting beta agonists all the time until their asthma gets worse, worse, worse. They get more of these chronic remodeling, chronic, chronic constructive changes, and they end up getting hospitalized. So this is to me why the ICS is always going to be a cornerstone on your maintenance control of um, asthma. And ICS we didn't inhale corticosteroid. So this is why I follow, and I think most people follow the new GINA guidelines. And the GINA guidelines, not only do they treat the underlying pathophysiology of asthma, which is bronchiolar inflammation, um, uh, they also make it extremely easy on the patient because you just have to give them one inhaler. So for step one and two, it's be low risk patients, symptoms less than daily, less than almost daily, nocturnal waking is less than weekly. We went over and do that. These patients would get PRN uh, ICS level. So they just take it whenever they need it. If they need it more, they get more ICS um, and they decrease their inflammation of the bronchioles. Step three, once these patients are either multiple risk factors, symptoms almost daily nocturnal awakenings, um, you do the same thing. So ICS lava, but you do it PRN and you do maintenance. Now, if they get a little bit less controlled um, or if they have long, low lung function uh, or if you're stepping down after acute exacerbation, uh, these patients are going to get them a, a uh, sorry, this is PRN low dose, the ICS lava, PRN and maintenance low dose, ICS lava. This would be PRN and maintenance uh, medium dose, ICS lava. So just really um, take Sometimes you can just increase the amount of doses that they're taking up their ICS level, which can be um, increasingly helpful, but you want to do a medium dose here. Uh, once it gets to refractory, this gets a, and the other thing to, to mention is that low dose maintenance PRN uh, ICS lab doesn't have as many side effects, things like pneumonia, thrush, um, systemic side effects. Once you start getting the medium dose, there you do start getting that more. So if you can, you really want to down, you want to follow the patient and uh, down titrate to low dose as 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 needed once they're better controlled. So refractory, there's a couple things you can do here. Um, some of the things you can consider is adding llama. Um, you can do consider high dose, uh, high dose ICS llama for a while. You don't want to do oral steroids, but if really needed, um, sometimes you can do it. And then here is where you really start thinking about biologics, um, especially for patients that have the allergic subtype. Um, and going through those biologics, uh, the ones that we really look at uh, for the allergic subtype, at least, is going to be one, omalizumab. So this one... Uh, Inhibits IgV, uh, IL, IL5 here. Inhibitors would be reslizumab, mepolizumab, or reslizumab. IL4 is things like dupilizumab, might be butchering these. IL13 are things like, I think, lepricizumab. And there is one that actually goes back and uh, um, decreases a lymphopoietin factor, so decreases T cell inflammation, and that one is Tess Elizabeth. 
Um, so not only does Tesla have bad help with TH2 asthma, it also helps with um, neutrophilic asthma as well as things like IL-17, probably IL-23, but you know GM, CSF, probably those cytokines increase the neutrophilic inflammation. The cytokines are secreted by T cells. So teslizumab is really the big one that you can use. Um, uh, really the big one that you can use for neutrophilic asthma. Uh, as, so that's one, one choice you can use, especially those patients that are not well controlled. All right, so here, uh, let's do mix up to 19, pulmonary question B. All right, so we went through a lot of the ad asthma management uh, for GINA guidelines. Remember that uh, ICS lab is really gonna be your cornerstone. Um, if refractory, you start thinking about the biologics that we went through, especially if they're allergic, but again, neutrophilic, or what we used to call intrinsic subtyping, you can use uh, tezepilumab um, uh, as well, which is a like antihistromal lithopoid inhibitor. Um, so then you have to think about covariance management. These are really things that you want to talk to the patient every time you visit them. Um, so things that can really, really help with asthma, what is going to be obesity, right? So consider talking to the patient about obesity, if the patient has obesity, controlling obesity, you cannot only control a lot of their other comorbidities, but um, you remember at adipocytes secrete IL-6 that it causes uh, full body systemic inflammation. So obesity is really an inflammatory state. So decreasing obesity can really, really help get control of these patients' asthma. Um, ask the patient about GERD. Um, so if the patient has GERD, if they're having microaspiration of gastric content, this can actually worsen some of their asthma control. So treatment with a PPI might be indicated. Um, another one you want to think about uh, is smoking. Smoking counseling can really, that's a huge irritant to the pulmonary uh, bronchial. So smoking counseling can be huge. Um, really talk to these patients about OSA, you know, some of their, and maybe do a stop diet score. But some of their symptoms are actually secondary to OSA. And, uh, you can have some uh, help by treating their, treating their OSA. Um, if they are asking about allergies, so not only ask them about nasal symptoms, but of course nasal drip, that can worsen coughs, uh, can worsen some asthma control, you treat that with Bonet's, but if they have allergies or certain things, um, you do trigger it with this as well. And the last one to think about, this can be separate or, um, uh, separate or can be coexistent. Um, with asthma um, is going to be uh, <coughs> um, that's called pharyngospasm. Uh, we'll go through this a little bit the exact one diagnosis of this, but some sometimes patients. Uh, in, in irritants or extra ties can actually get a deduction of their vocal cords with laryngospasm. They get inspiratory and expiratory wheezing. Sometimes they may present the hospital with this. They may be diagnosed with asthma from the wheezing, but the reality is from their vocal cords. Um, things that can clue you in is that they have really incredible control. They have really good control outside of when they have symptoms, um, all because from that a deduction of their vocal cords during uh, irritation or exercise. Um, the only way to diagnose is uh, the radioscopy and seeing vocal cord um, any deduction during uh, uh, one of these episodes, but it can be tough because patients are really short of breath and may not tolerate that well. If you are thinking that the patient has uh, vocal cord spasms, you can kind of refer them to speech therapy. We can work on um, some sort of some therapy to reduce uh, any deduction of your vocal cords. Um, so not only just bad, but more vocal cord spasms. So can can coexist or can be misdiagnosed. So always ask about comorbidities as well. I think this is our last question. Um, just wanted to other maybe some other management you could do for asthma. Um, you know we went through a lot of the things already. Uh, things that we don't use anymore is like mast cell, mast cell inhibitors. You know, um, there is glucotriene inhibitors. You know, readers about this, something like Luke has. 
read about this, you know, some patients, they, sometimes you can add them on as an alternative, maybe someone that doesn't tolerate ICS logic that well. Some patients will respond, some patients won't respond, um, and it can kind of be separate and not predictable by their phenotype, so it could be kind of tough. One time you will use antidote to try to you really think it's NSAID or has to be reduced. Uh, and then lastly, remember things that open up your airways, so fight or flight. Um, so beta agonists are, you know, you want to, if you got a fight, you got to breathe, uh, beta agonists are going to open up your airways. Um, and then, uh, you know, llamas sometimes add on refractory therapy, so muspiratic uh, antagonists, right? So fight or flight, um, and then you want to, uh, for the llamas, you want to uh, agonize it, you want to open up the airways in fight or flight mode. Llamas more rest and digest, you don't need those airways open just as much if you're just hanging around. Uh, so you really want to inhibit uh, muscarinic uh, in terms of the bronchioles um, to hit it smooth muscle contraction. Uh, but mostly, remember, it's going to be your llamas, it's going to be your steroids. It's going to be your main backbone. And then you might think about things like um, TH2, uh, so IL-4 inhibition, nepolizumab. Lepertizumab, especially in the allergic subtypes for patients, um, and then even tezapizumab you can use sometimes with for severe refractory like neutrophil asthma. All right, um, this is our last uh, vocal cord dysfunction, not vocal cord spasm, um, and that's it. So review. Um, this is your interpretation of your PFDs uh, <coughs> from. Feel free to go back. I'm not going to go through all these slides again, but I'll leave them here just so you guys can. Uh, look at them. So here's my interpretation of PFTs with underlying pathophysiology. Um, here's kind of like a one slide on asthma, pathogenesis, diagnosis, manifestation, subtypes um, that you might see in like a test on. Um, you know, remember, big thing with asthma, some patients can have that chronic remodeling, mucus hypersecretion, smooth muscle uh, hypertrophy. And really narrowing of that airway, but not all people have that. Some people might just have more predominance of reversal bronchial constriction, and those patients you may have to diagnose with a uh, methylcholine challenge. So remember, consider methylcholine challenge anytime you have normal PFTs in a high succession. Uh, this is your GINA guidelines for asthma management. Remember the pathogenesis of asthma in the background is really going to be inflammation of the airway. So your ICS and LAMA together. Um, is going to be your backbone. Do it PRM in patients who are somewhat rel controlled. Um, uh, do maintenance in high risk patients or, or once they're starting to get more poorly controlled. And if they're more poorly controlled or if they have low lung function or right after they have an exacerbation, do a medium dose of ICS and LABA. Refractory gets a little bit more nuanced. You can consider adding LABA, you consider high dose ICS and steroids, and you can sort of add on. Treatment by biologic phenotype, which we reviewed uh, in this slide. Um, and then comorbidity management, um, you know, things to look at OSA, obesity, smoking, sinus disease, uh, GERD, um, you know, allergens, and vocal cord dysfunction, all things that you really want to ask about or increase your differential. As sometimes they can co occur with asthma, and treating these things can really help with asthma control. Um, we went through a little bit already of all the management of asthma, but Especially over here, there's a lot of your biologics that can uh, lead to better asthma control in patients that have allergic subtype of asthma, depending on what their IG and physicals are. Remember, T cell inflammation also increases neutrophilic inflammation. So, something like tezabalumab tes tes um, can not only decrease TH2 cell inflammation, but probably also like TH17 neutrophilic inflammation. And that's it.